All right, guys, it's time for another spooky story. We're going to read Hop Frog by Edgar Allan Poe, published in 1849. I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking, to tell a good story of the joke kind, and to tell it well was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, too, being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as imitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking, or whether there's something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine. But certain it is that a, a lean joker is a rara avis in terris. About the refinements, or as he called them, the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. He had an especial admiration for breadth in a jest, and would often put up with length for the sake of it. Over niceties wearied him. He would have preferred Rabelais, Gargantua to Zadig, Voltaire, and upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools who wore motley with caps and bells and were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool. The fact is, he required something in the ways of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of his seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however, his value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact that he was also a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarves were as common at court in those days as fools, and many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days, days are rather long at court than elsewhere, without both a jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But as I have already observed, your jesters, in 99 cases out of 100, are fat, round, and unwieldy, so that it was no small source of self-gratulation with our king that, in Hop Frog, this was the fool's name, he possessed a triplicate treasure in one person. I believe the name Hop Frog was not that given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, but it was conferred upon him by general consent of several ministers on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hop Frog could only get along in a sort of interjectional gait, something in between a leap and a wriggle, a movement that afforded illimitable amusement and, of course, consolation to the king for, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and con a constitutional swelling of the head, the king by his whole court, was accounted as a capital figure. But although Hop Frog, through the distortion of his legs, could move only with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, the prodigious muscular power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms, by way of compensation for deficiency in the lower limbs, enabled him to perform feats of wonderful dexterity where trees or ropes were in question, or anything else to climb. At such exercise, he certainly much more resembled a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. I'm not able to say with precision from what country Hop Frog originally came. It was from some barbarous region, however, that no person had ever heard of, a vast distance from the court of our king. Hop Frog and a young girl, very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvelous dancer, had been forcibly carried off from their respective homes in adjoining provinces and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever victorious generals. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered that at that a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon be they soon became sworn friends. Hop Frog, who, although he made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, had it not in his power to render Trippetta many services. But she, on the account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted. So she possessed much influence and never failed to use it whenever she could for the benefit of Hop Frog. On some grand state occasion, I forgot what, the king determined to have a masquerade, and wherever a masquerade or anything of that kind occurred at our court, then the talents, both of Hop Frog and Trippetta, were sure to be called into play. Hop Frog, in especial, was so inventive in the way of getting up pageants, suggesting novel characters and arranging costumes, for masked balls that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed for the fit had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trippetta's eye with every kind of device which could possibly give eclat to a masquerade. 
The whole court was in a fever of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might well be supposed that everybody had come to a decision on some points. Many had made up their minds as to what roles they should assume, a week or even a month in advance. And in fact, there was not a particular a particle of indecision anywhere, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. Uh, when they hesitated, I, I could never tell unless they did it by way of a joke. More probably, they found it difficult, on account of being so fat, to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and as a last resort, they sent for Trepetta and Hot Frog. When the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven members of his cabinet council. But the monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hot Frog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes and took pleasure in forcing Hot Frog to drink and, as the king called it, to be merry. Come here, Hot Frog, said he as the jester and his friend entered the room. Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends. Here, Hot Frog sighed. And then let us have the benefit of your invention. We want characters. Characters, man. Something novel, out of the way. We are wearied with this everlasting sameness. Come, drink. The wine will brighten your wits. Hot Frog endeavored, as usual, to get up a jest in reply to these advances from the king, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink it to his absent friends forced the tears to his eyes. Many large, bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it humbly from the hands of the tyrant. <laughs> Roared the latter as the dwarf reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do! Why, your eyes are shining already! Poor fellow, his large eyes gleamed rather than shone, for the effect of wine on his excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked around upon the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. And now to business, said the prime minister, a very fat man. Yes, said the king, come lend us your assistance. Characters, my fine fellow, we need, we stand in need of characters. All of us. <laughs> and as this was seriously meant for a joke, his laugh was chorused by the seven. Hot Frog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. Uh, come, come, said the king impatiently. Have you nothing to suggest? I am endeavoring for, to think of something novel, replied the dwarf abstractedly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine. Endeavoring, cried, cried the tyrant fiercely. What do you mean by that? Oh, I perceive you are sulky and want more wine. Here, drink this. He poured out another goblet full and offered it to the cripple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, shouted the monster, or by the fiends. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtiers smirked. Trepetta, pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat and, falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss at what to do or say, how most becomingly to express his indignation. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up the best she could and, not daring to even sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. There was a dead silence for about half a minute, during which the falling of a leaf or of a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracting grating sound which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. What? What? What are you making that noise for? demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered in great measure from his intoxication, and looks fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, I, I, how could it have been me? The sound appeared to come without, come from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was the parrot at the window, wetting his bill upon the cage wires. True, replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestions, but on the honor of a knight, I could have sworn it was the gritting of this vagabond's teeth. Hereupon the dwarf laughed, the king was too confirmed a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. 
The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no very perceptible ill effect, Hot Frog entered at once, and with spirit, into the plans for the masquerade. I cannot tell what was the association of the idea, observed he very tranquilly, and as if he had never tasted wine in his life. But just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion. One of my own country frolics, often enacted among us at our masquerades, but here it will be new altogether. Unfortunately, however, it requires a company of eight persons, and... Here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight chained orangutans, and it really is excellent sport if well enacted. We will enact it, remarked the king, drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids. The beauty of the game, continued Hot Frog, lies in the fright it occasions among women. Capital, roared in chorus the monarch in his ministry. I will equip you, equip you as orangutans, proceeded the dwarf. Leave all that to me. The resemblance will be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts. And of course, they will be much as terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite, exclaimed the king. Hot frog, I will make a man of you. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. You are supposed to have escaped unmasked from your keepers. Your majesty cannot concede the effect produced at a masquerade by eight chained orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in ex execution the scheme of Hop Frog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, been very rarely seen in any part of the civilized world, and as the imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature were thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stockinet, shirts, and drawers. They were then saturated by tar. At this stage of the process, some of the party suggested feathers, but the suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the eight, by ocular demonstration, that the hair of such a brute as orangutan was much more efficiently represented by flax. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First, it was passed about the waist of the king and tied, then about... Then about another of the party, and also tied, then about all successively in the same manner. When the chaining arrangement was complete, the party stood as far apart from each other as possible. They formed a circle, and to make things appear natural, Hop Frog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters at right angles across the circle, after the fashion adopted at the present day by those who capture chimpanzees or other large apes in Borneo. The grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty, and receiving the light of the sun only through a single window at top. At night, the season for which the apartment was especially designed, it was illuminated principally by a large chandelier, depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered or elevated by means of counterbalance as usual. In order to not look unsightly, this ladder passed outside of the cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Trippetta's superintendence, but in some particulars it seemed she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf. At his suggestion, it was on that occasion that the chandelier was removed. Its waxen drippings, which in weather so warm was quite possible to prevent, would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses of the guests, who, on account of the crowded state of the saloon, could not all be expected to keep out from its center, that is to say, from under the chandelier. Additional sconces were set in various parts of the hall, and out of the war and a flambeau emitting a sweet odor was placed on the right-hand side of each of the caryatides that stood against the wall, some 50 or 60 altogether. The eight orangutans, taking Hop Frog's advice, 
waited patiently until midnight, when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders, before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, that they, than they rushed, or rather rolled in altogether, for the impediment of their chains caused most of the party to fall and to stumble as they entered. The excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious and filled the heart of the king with glee. As had been anticipated, there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts of some kind in reality, if not precisely orangutans. Many of the women swooned with affright, and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all the weapons in the saloon, his party might soon have expiated their frolic in blood. As it was, a general rush was made for the doors, but the king ordered them to be locked immediately upon his entrance, and at the dwarf's suggestion, the keys had been deposited with him. While the tumult was at its height, each masquerader, attentive only to his own safely, safety, for in fact there was much real danger from the pressure of the excited crowd, the chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung, which had been drawn up on its removal, might have been seen very gradually to descend, until its hook extremity came within three feet of the floor. Soon after this, the king and his seven friends, having reeled about the, fall in, uh, the hall in all directions, found themselves at length in its center, and of course, in the immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf, who had followed noiselessly at their heels, incited them to keep up the commotion, who uh, took hold of his own chain at the intersection of the two portions which crossed the circle diametrically at the right angles. Here, with the rapidity of thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend, and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach, and, as an inevitable consequence, to drag the orangutans together in close connection and face to face. The masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, and beginning to regard the whole matter as well contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter as the predicament of the apes. Leave them to me, now screamed Hot Frog, his shrill voice making itself easily heard through all the den. Leave them to me, I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are. Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall. When seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides, he returned, as he went to the center of the room leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thence clambered a few feet th up the chair, holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans and screaming, I shall soon find out who they are. And now, while the whole assembly, the apes included, were convulsed with laughter, the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle, when the chain flew violently up for about thirty feet, dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans and leaving them suspended in midair between the skylight and the floor. Hot Frog, clinging to the chain as it rose, maintained his relative position in respect to the eight maskers, and still, as if nothing were the matter, continued to thrust his torch down towards them, as though endeavoring to discover who they were. So thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent that a dead silence, about a minute's duration, ensued. It was broken by just such a low, harsh grating sound as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counselors when the former threw the wine in the face of Trippetta. But on the present occasion, there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf, who ground them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth and glared, with an expression of maniacal rage, into the upturned countenance of the king and his seven companions. Aha! said at length the infuriated jester. Aha! I begin to see who these people are now. Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame. In less than half a minute, the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely, and the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken, and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length, the flames suddenly increased in virulence, forcing the jester to climb higher up on the chain and to be out of their reach. As he made his movement, the crowd sank, and for a brief instant into silence, the dwarf seized his opportunity to, and spoke once more. I s now see distinctly, he said, what manner of people these maskers are. They are a great king and his seven privy counselors, a king who does not scruple to strike defenseless girl and his seven counselors who abet him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply Hopfrog, the jester, and this is my last jest. 
Owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which it, ad it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end to his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in their chains, a fetid, blackened, hideous, indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at them, clambered leisurely to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trippetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been the accomplice of a friend in his fiery revenge, and that, together, they effected their escape to their own country, for neither was seen again. Let this be a lesson to you. You should probably treat people right. Like, man, it's weird to think that back in the day, it was just, that was just a normal thing. To treat somebody like a subhuman. But yeah. Good job, Hot Frog. You got that revenge.